Right, hi, everyone. It's great to see you uh, joining from all over the world. Welcome to the Extreme Tech Challenge finals for the mobility and smart cities category. My name is Victoria Slivkoff and uh, you're sticking with me today. Just to get a sense of where you're all joining from, uh, you know, please type in chat sort of where are you joining from to get a sense of the community. Uh, we have someone from India, Silicon Valley, Malaysia, Indonesia, Berkeley, Irvine, Switzerland. someone from Irvine, Japan, Palo Alto, Oakland, France. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, this is so cool. I think it really speaks to um, the global nature of XTC. Um, so first of all, a little background on Extreme Tech Challenge for those who are new to us. We're the world's largest tech innovation ecosystem for making the world a radically better place. Um, we're really the launching pad for the disruptive innovations that can power a more sustainable, equitable, healthy, inclusive, and prosperous world. And think of us uh, as at the nexus of this global community of entrepreneurs, uh, large corporates, uh, VCs, academia, philanthropists, policymakers, um, NGOs, and just, you know, change makers alike working together to solve the grand challenges of today and tomorrow. The UN Sustainable Development Goals serve as a framework for our competition tracks, um, uh, which are uh, ag tech, food and water, clean tech energy, ed tech, enabling tech, fintech, health tech, and uh, what we're hearing today, the mobility and smart cities track. Um, not only is this the right thing to do, but investing in purpose-driven tech also contributes to better business results, as we've seen of late. XTC was founded by our co-founders, Young Sung and Bill Tai, two legendary Silicon Valley-based investors, corporate executives, and entrepreneurs themselves who have invested in and have built uh, multi-billion dollar companies that are household names. And they're passionate about our mission to empower all of you entrepreneurs building innovative technologies that are improving the world. Uh, and really believe in this power of the community to come together to identify uh, potentially market-leading companies that can impact the world in a big way, and then provide the rocket fuel to help them scale faster. So follow them on social media and check out Young's video interview series, The Next Wave, uh, for uh, really wonderful thoughts and insights and practical advice for founders and investors alike. Through participating, exceptional startups such as the uh, companies pitching today will gain global visibility, access to capital, uh, corporate strategic partnerships, mentorship, and develop relationships and friendships that would carry you far into the future. So welcome to the XCC family. Mm -hmm. And this year, over 3,700 startups applied for almost 100 countries, and 80 finalists uh, were selected by over 300 judges across our 21 regional competitions around the world and uh, through open application. So these 80 exceptional uh, companies all have emerged as the top 2% from a very competitive um, application pool. Mm -hmm. That. Um, and I want to say this is just an amazing achievement and all of the startups that made it this far are winners in their own right. Here's a look at the entire cohort of 2021 global finalists. Uh, you should all check them out. So to learn more, head to our website, extremetechchallenge.org. And for today, here's a look at the finalist cohort for the mobility and smart cities category. And I'm so excited for you to hear from these seven uh, great uh, startups shown here and learn about the how they're disrupting their, uh, their particular tracks. So before we get to the presentations, I'd like to welcome our esteemed judging panel. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome uh, Junho Bay, who is the investment manager from Air Asia Digital. Shingya Kasuga, he is a partner at IT Farm, um, who is also an XTC partner leading our regional competition, XTC Japan. Jay Kim, technology business development lead from Ford Motor Company. And Bill Riker, a partner at Pegasus Ventures, and he's a co-author of the book, Getting to Wow, Silicon Valley Pitch Secrets for Entrepreneurs. So welcome, judges. I wanted to turn it over to each of you for a few words on your particular interest in the mobility and smart cities category. Uh, let me start with you, Junho. Hi. 
Uh, my name is Junho Bay. Uh, I lead the invest, uh, corporate venture capital arm of AirAsia. Uh, we are a low cost carrier out here in Southeast Asia. Pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks for inviting me and excited to learn more about your companies. Okay, maybe a little bit about what type of companies do you invest in? Uh, so we usually, uh, we're more traditional in, in terms of looking at travel centric companies, but recently we have been uh, venturing more out into lifestyle centric companies. So adding more frequency to the, the value propositions that we have for the users around this region. Uh, especially looking at consumer internet companies. Great, thank you, Jun Ho. Uh, now headed over to uh, Shinya. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here today. I'm Shinya Kasugo from IT Farm, a venture capital headquartered in Tokyo, investing in early stage disruptive tech startups and also organizing CC Japan regional round. We are domain agnostic and focusing in early stage tech startups from pre C to C Series A across the world without geographic limitation, including early stage investments in Zoom, Wish, and Tubi in our 20 years history. And we're not just a pure investor, but also a business development team to bring our international portfolio to Japan market and vice versa. So I'm looking forward to the exciting discussions with all the great founders here today. Thank you. Cool. And thank you for having been a great XCC partner. Um, next, let me introduce Jay Kim. Please, a few words. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Victoria. Uh, so my name is Jay Kim, uh, Technology uh, Business Development out of the uh, Fort Palo Alto office. Um, so we're the innovation office uh, out here in uh, Silicon Valley. And basically our, our charter is really to be the eyes and ears for Ford Motor Company for the startups um, and, the, you know, and, and the great technologies they're building. And, uh, you know, really the charter we have out here as well is, um, you know, to transform Ford from a 20th century automotive company into a 21st century smart mobility company. So really happy to be here and look forward to seeing, the, uh, you know, the great startups that are going to be presenting today. Thank you, Victoria. Yeah, and thank you for the terrific, uh, terrific partnership from Ford. Um, and Bill, a few words from you. And thank you for having been a, a, a boot camp speaker. That was a terrific session. Is Bill on mute? I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Victoria. And uh, yeah, thank you for inviting me in. And congratulations on a spectacular uh, program and platform here. Um, I am a partner at Pegasus Tech Ventures, which is a $1.5 billion global venture fund. We invest pre across the board in sectors and geographies and stages from seed to pre-IPO. Um, we have several programs of interest in mobility and smart cities. We happen to be investors in Bird on the one hand. We have an office in Southeast Asia. We're investors in Gojek on the other hand. Um, and we uh, uh, look for both mobility and smart cities, types of technologies, IoT, IO, you know, Internet of, of Things. Um, and internet of everything uh, across the world. So um, thank you very much for having me. I'm looking forward to hearing today's pitches. Great, awesome. So let's get to that. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, welcome Grintech, uh, who has a swappable locked uh, smart lithium battery pack technology for electric vehicles. Uh, so please, our presenter from Grintech, please take the stage. So uh, good morning, everyone. I will not take much time of you. I will quickly run you through a short introduction about Green Tech. And I know it's not, a, I will not be able to share you all the informations. Uh, feel free to reach out to us to get to know us more in more details. Um, so uh, just uh, a quick summary uh, where the STC help helped us compile uh, to run through about an ABC of our company. Everyone says um, uh, pollution is a concern, global climate change is a concern, but uh, it will not work until we uh, make the solutions economically viable and accessible to the masses. So that is where uh, Green Tech is trying to do. Uh, we believe that the time for electric vehicles and renewables have come, and energy storage is going to play a crucial role for the successful adoption of the same. That's uh, We are looking to make affordable uh, energy storage uh, accessible to masses in the uh, developing world, starting with India, uh, because we have a firm belief if we uh, successfully scale up 
some solutions in India, we can take it to all the developing worlds like Southeast Asia, Asia Africa, etc. So our approach is to develop uh, modular technologies uh, for lithium ion batteries where we can uh, develop uh, product, uh, products for different applications quickly and affordably uh, for the masses. The benefit is high energy cost, uh, low energy density and smarter. Uh, batteries are not batteries now, they are smart connected energy storage devices. So uh, in India, our competition is uh, many resellers and assemblers, not a technology enabled manufacturers. I will cover about our team in later slides. So as I mentioned, uh, tech for good, it's all about making uh, solutions for uh, which can enable climate uh, control uh, accessible to the masses at affordable price. Uh, there is a huge uh, and demand and supply gap for uh, EV batteries in the market as uh, uh, we all know, uh, nothing to uh, share more details on that. Uh, if uh, we talk about Indian market uh, as per a government study, EV market in 2025 and 2030 is going to be scaling up very fast. And there is a huge market uh, gap uh, for uh, needs of good quality suppliers in India and developing world. If we look into the EV supply chain uh, or the battery chain of the electric vehicles, uh, battery, motor and controller uh, are the three crucial components uh, which plays a, a major contribution to the bomb cost of the electric vehicles and battery is one major out of that. In India or any developing world, if we see electric vehicles or low cost uh, transportation vehicles like e electric rickshaws or e-rickshaws or tuk-tuk or tricycles plays a major role in the last mile connectivity in uh, transportation or the personal transportation. And those are the uh, sectors which need to be made accessible or EVs in that sectors need to be made affordable. Thus, uh, that is our focus area. Having said all that, still EV makers are supplying, uh, struggling to find a good technology partners, uh, or I will not say suppliers, they are looking for strategic suppliers where green tech comes into play. So this is what we do. Uh, there are a lot of cell chemistries, there are a lot of cell formats, there are a lot of cell technologies, uh, but EV makers need not be concerned about that. Uh, that is where uh, green tech or a player like green tech comes into picture, where we make a bridge between the uh, international uh, cell uh, market and uh, supplying what EV makers need for their vehicle. So we do uh, what we call as a co-development. We have our mechanical team, thermal team, embedded hardware team, embedded software team and electrical team working together to make products which EV makers can uh, quickly integrate into their product and scale up their EV markets. So our USP is about our product is uh, local uh, design capability. We can design using any technologies, any type of cells, which make the product vibe, co techno commercially viable. Our intention is to make product which uh, suits the needs of the con uh, consumer of our customer and make it affordable. Temperature is a major problem for lithium ion batteries. And being in India, we have developed innovative active and passive thermal solutions, which are developed and we can implement or include in our products at affordable cost. We work closely with companies like NXP, Qualcomm, ST, uh, uh, NTI, et cetera, to enable cutting edge VMS technologies to the market at the earliest. As I mentioned, uh, batteries are not uh, black boxes now, they are smart connected devices. So we have connectivity technologies starting with 2G, 4G and MPIoT to make uh, battery accessible, affordable and enable the fleet operators using EVs to control their battery assets uh, very smoothly. We work with global uh, certifying agencies to certify the product because the safety of the battery is the most important. And one thing which we are fighting off uh, in the uh, to make the market, develop the market or promote the market is the safety concerns of the customers. We are trying to work with different agencies to build a confidence that EVs are safe. Our batteries are powered by analytics. Uh, it may sound outward like what the batteries have to do with analytics, but analytics is a something with a huge uh, potential to make the batteries much safer and uh, optimize the performance. Our uh, 
analytics start with the cell characterization and we study lot of different type of cells at different conditions user behaviors and find out the best suitable cell for the uh, our applications or uh, applications in the developing economies and thermal high thermal areas uh, we find out the cell we optimize the pattern design uh, we assembly uh, during our even our assembly we do lot of qualitative analysis of our data collected during assembly to figure out the any quality issues during the assembly or uh, we relate for our future uh, uh, to make our future products better we relate our uh, any uh, issue find in our battery pack uh, with the data of uh, assembly and try to relate and uh, figure out any potential issues in the future we work closely with our vehicle manufacturers to integrate uh, their testing and performance confirmation do, when the batteries are installed in the vehicle and we collect lot of field data try to relate that predict uh, any failures and uh, absolute uh, pro, uh, do the profiling of the uh, end user drivers and uh, help them have a better uh, smoother and uh, efficient uh, uh, driving experience uh, so uh, by doing all that what we are bringing to table is the different potential uh, bat battery packs in different range it may sound very overwhelming but having developed the modular technologies for different applications it enable us to develop multiple products at a very low time and cost of, uh, 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 investment so we have a, a battery packs from 12 volt to uh, 350 volts in product and from 60 uh, whatever to uh, 100 uh, kilowatt hour in our portfolio so our growth pack we started in 2017 with a determined team we developed uh, it started r&d with uh, indian institute of technology madras which is a premium institute in india in 2018 we developed products and patent with patented technology in 2019 we started our manufacturing in 2020 in 2021 we are intend to set up the automotive soft floor with zero ppm and we have ambitions to go global in 2022 our recognitions have been as i mentioned we have a technology development collaboration with indian institute of technology madras we have been a qualcomm uh, design in india challenge winner in 2019 we have been shortlisted by mg as top 10 finalist startups in mg developer program 2021 and uh, we have been top 3 in nxp tech startup challenge in 2021 in india which enabled us to reach this platform our customers are uh majorly major indian electric two and three wheeler manufacturers major indian electric tractor and lcv manufacturers this is one of the areas which are most promising and emerging uh adopter of e mobility and recently we have start a uh, partnering with global customers so we have major us based electric truck manufacturers as our customers about the green tech green tech was started by myself and uh, nicholas mitra in 2013 we got incubated at iit madras and in 2020 we decided that our technology is mature we set up the uh, manufacturing plant by raising around 2, 2 million usd from uh, uh, prominent uh, investors like mr lakshmi narayan and dr sumantran who is a industry uh, veteran this is our team uh, we have a team of around 55 people in different domains who make it possible uh, for us to deliver what we have been uh doing till now and way forward thank you very much uh uh to uh, for having us here i would like to take questions from jury hey thank you puni judges please jump in i know we're running a little long with this one okay mm -hmm. so puni i'm sorry puni could i could i ask Yeah, go ahead. Jump in, Bill. Yeah, yeah. So, Puni, thank you. Uh, you know, very impressive. Great job. I'm, I'm a little unclear on how far along you are in terms of design wins. Is all all of those images on that graph? Are you in production with all of those companies, or are you? Are they targets, or are you doing development work? Where are you in terms of? Where are you in terms of your traction? So, uh, so we have around uh, USD one million in revenue till date, and oh. uh, the customers which we have supplied to is a 
टू व्हीलर मैन्युफैक्चर विच वी हैव स्टार्ट सप्लाइंग फिंच फोर्टी एट फिंच फोर्टी एट ड्यूरा दैट इज इन कमर्शियल प्रोडक्शन रॉबिन सेवेंटी टू इज अंडर टेस्टिंग विद कस्टमर सिकरा मेजर ई रिक्शा मैन्युफैक्चर आर टेस्टिंग राइट नॉट दैट्स ए प्रोडक्ट अंडर सर्टिफिकेशन फॉल्कन इज द प्रोडक्ट फॉर ट्रैक्टर्स one uh, tractor manufacturer have tested validated and certified and they are planning their cl production and two tractor manufacturers are under testing right now so the products have we have developed do you have contracts for volume for volume shipment yet or are you still in this sort of design and pilot phase with all these guys uh we have uh, in for from one of the tractor manufacturers we have got a 3 year loi okay uh, and from uh, one of the two wheeler manufacturers we have got a po for first thousand batteries and okay. uh, it's will be a repetitive order after that okay and then you didn't tell us anything about your economics you know and your margins you know how much cheaper better you know you didn't give us any of that but let me i don't know if the other judges want to jump in but i i would have loved to hear more about the economics of your business but bill uh, i will uh, try to answer and if required i will share the more details over email to you as well so we have a gross margin around 15 to 20% and as compared to competition we are uh, as compared to the imported low quality products we are 10 to 15% higher but with a very better quality but as compared to the equivalent equivalent products imported from outside india we are 10 to 15% cheaper okay okay all right thank you other judge for Sure. <laughs> yeah, let me take my next question. Uh, do you have any patented IP or trade secret that makes your technology difficult to be copied by your competitor? Yes. So, uh, sorry I missed to cover that in my presentation. We have developed some uh, prototype uh, patented technologies uh, while we participated in Qualcomm Design in India challenge. So the computing power of our BMS is 7.5 times more than any competitive uh, products in the market. which is a patented technology so it enables us to run our algorithms on the bms itself rather than sending data to cloud process algorithms over there and bring data back to the bms so that is not required we are able to run most of our algorithms at a very uh, fast speed and with, with the accurate results in our bms itself okay thank you and um, sorry let me uh, ask one follow on question So uh what makes you you know your battery lower cost you know than your competitors is it you know uh deriving from some technology or you know uh, do, uh deriving from your lower labor cost or any kind of other factor uh so i will say that the our bomb cost is very uh, uh, optimized only thing is once you have done a modular engineering uh, efforts that modular engineering reduce our development cost as well as well as enable us to develop uh, sophisticated products uh, at a lower cost so it's all about technology development and how we can reuse or modularize our development efforts okay thank you very much okay great thank you for your presentation Thank you Victoria thank you for having us over here and thank you for everyone uh, we look look forward to keep in touch and if you have any further questions feel free to reach out to us over linkedin or email thank you okay great and let's give a minute to the uh, judges to 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 follow up on their scoring and let's let's bring up photokai our next presenter to get settled thanks a lot Victoria can everyone see that okay Yes, yes. And just a quick reminder that everyone gets 4 minutes to uh to pitch. Okay. Set. Okay. Great. The floor is yours. Excellent. Hi everyone. I'm Chris, CEO of Photokite. Uh we are a 50-person team of autonomous vehicle and aerial robotics experts set out with a mission to help first responders save lives and preserve property. Uh I'm going to run a quick visual for you guys uh just to give you kind of a a clear idea of what we're doing while I talk through it. Um 
So our patented technology enables us um, basically to provide intelligent um, drone in a box solutions. And do you guys see that video playing? No. No, it's not playing. Not coming through for you guys. Okay. Let's see. <laughs> see if we can see if we can fix that really quick. Mm -hmm. Is that better? We're getting yeah. some images. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, sorry. Sorry for the issues then. Um, okay. Well, uh, so again, our patented technology, we, it enables us to provide an intelligent drone in a box solution that gets installed in the top of fire trucks and public safety vehicles. So that when a firefighter shows up to their scene, they push a single button and our system opens up and deploys itself and flies up to 150 feet in height. Uh, if the video is not coming through clearly, I, I can get, just start to flip through a few visuals as kind of a backup here. Um, so once it's up it, to 150 feet, again, fully autonomous, it starts to provide a helicopter-like view of each response. And from up there, we provide both thermal and regular video down to the ground. And this information helps first responders size up and assess their incidents quickly and safely. So we've already deployed our systems with fire departments like Paris, Milan, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, and many more. Uh, these customers have used their system on a daily basis to gain that aerial information they need to save lives and keep their team safe. So our current focus markets are European and North American public safety segments. This represents approximately a $12.5 billion market opportunity with very high barriers to entry. And there are a few several, or there are several things that we do with our solution to really stand out from the crowd. A few examples are flight time, autonomy, and regulations. So while normal drones can be flown for about 20 or 30 minutes, our, active, our systems actively use their tether to provide power and fly for over 24 hours. And regulators have also identified our technology's inherent safety benefits, and Photokite is the only system approved by the FAA to be operated by any firefighter or public safety officer without needing a pilot's license. And that's a really, really key thing when it comes to scalable operations. Uh, but most importantly, really, the real benefit to the user is the fact that they gain aerial information without ever piloting the system. It's as autonomous and as simple as it gets. They simply push a button, launch on a tablet, uh, set their altitude and camera angle, and the system takes care of the rest. Now, we've already signed on the world's top two market leaders as distribution partners, both of them early identifiers of our game-changing solution. Oshkosh is one of them. They're the world leader in fire truck manufacturing, and they build our systems directly into the top of their fire trucks, as you can see here. Uh, Axon, right, is, is a world leader um, in connected device supply to public safety, and they're providing photokites as an integrated solutions in their incident response platform. Those partners and 10 more in Europe are really ramping up orders and installa base, installation base of our product, soon to make this system the most extensively used public safety unmanned system in the world. Now, our customers have really identified um, that uh, that our product roadmap is putting us on track to fully digitalizing the public safety incident scene. So personnel tracking, video analytics, measurement, mapping, and reconstruction, all of these are now possible given our unique solution that's used on a daily basis from that aerial contextual view. So while fire and public safety teams sign on to purchase or lease photokites um, for installation into their vehicles, they all end up signing on to service contracts that build over time with additional software service layer offerings, establishing the Photokite really as a digital data hub at fire and emergency response scenes. And that includes retrofitting into these old fire trucks, into these old public safety vehicles that really don't have that connectivity and compute basis, but it's still a very large installation base. Uh, beyond the life-saving impact that we strive for every day, we're also particularly proud to be part of the XTC cohort because we believe our solution of visualizing and building measurable content 
context to everyday first responders. We'll also bring added accountability to sectors like law enforcement and police markets. Body cameras and dash cameras have started to tell part of the story, but an overhead and fully contextual video record of each incident really helps ensure that evidence lockers are complete. And we're, we're quite excited about that as a team. Uh, we're currently supported by an incredible investor base, including Credit Suisse, Sony, Qualcomm, uh, and others. We've, we've also gained further support through programs like Horizon 2020 grants, as well as a first place finish in the world's largest unmanned aerial system accelerator, Genius New York. And we're currently closing our Series B uh, investment um, and uh, eager to grow our impact throughout public safety markets, helping those teams save lives and preserve property. Uh, thank you very much for, for the time. Could you give us, you know, one or two case studies of, sorry, I mean, I get the, the high-level the high idea, you got more information. Mm -hmm. um, what is it really that makes the difference? Sure. Uh, so, I, yeah. so a great a great example is um, a fire fire brigade recently showed up to a residential fire. Um, they got calls for it, and and the very first vehicle that showed up had a photokite. They were able to pop it up into the air, uh, get a quick visual, and it just hap just so happened that the incident commander, who's looking at the tablet, caught on the thermal camera that out the back door of this building that was on fire, the two people that were reported inside ran out the back door, hopped a fence, and were off. Now, this was seconds before that fire brigade sent three firefighters into that burning building, right? And so into an empty burning building. Now, this saves team resources. It also keeps those firefighters safe from going into an empty building that they were reported with two firefighters inside. So that aerial intelligence, that aerial information with the full context of the full scene, including on sides of the buildings that you're not necessarily seeing, really made a difference there. There's also situations like search and rescue where a uh, car crashes off the side of the road and somebody uh, either is ejected or uh, is you know, confused, stumbles out of the vehicle and collapses somewhere. This has already been used several times to quickly identify where that person is but without a lengthy and labor intensive foot search, finding that person quicker to help uh, save their life and, and really, really accelerate that process. So we've been really motivated by applications like that and uh, we've, we've continued striving for those. Okay, and then uh, technically, uh, is is the drone essentially autonomous? Um, I mean, I don't have, or I don't have to fly it. It goes to a relatively fixed place. Yeah, that that's right. right. In fact, our core IP is really the ability for the system to fly 100% autonomously. So that's there's zero joysticks in the entire system. There's zero GPS dependency. Our system truly flies in closed loop form completely autonomously. That means that it can operate in GPS denied environments. It can be operated by anybody who's not a trained pilot. And that's why regulators have, uh, have given us those advantages. So that's that's really our core IP, which is patented and, and really, really lengthy. Okay. And then I assume I can point and zoom? That's right. Okay. Yeah. And it's, it's basically the exact same intuitive uh, operation like a smartphone, right? You're basically swiping or double tapping, and our system is intelligent enough to snap and center on the object that you're uh, trying to focus on and stays right there. Okay, and then the economics, how, you know, what do you charge, you know, what do you cost, what are your margins, you know? Yeah, as a, as a as a public as a public um, uh, competition, we don't really want to give margins away uh, publicly. But um, they, it is it is public safety space and and uh, industrial space, so margins are quite uh, both competitive and attractive. Uh, we do have this blended uh, business model where it's both uh, hardware as a service system sales as well as these software service offerings. Uh, it turns out that every single one of our customers that have a system end up adding on software service offerings, which increases our overall gross margin quite a bit down the line. Okay. And is there any, is there any ROI calculation? I mean, I, I get, you know, it's a good thing to save lives, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. but, I mean, but in, terms, in terms of yeah. budget, you know, how do you convince how do you, you know, in a world of limited budgets, this is another expense. What do they give up in order to buy you? 
Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a great question. Um, at the end of the day, uh, I think what's worth noting is in the public space safety space in particular, it started to look like more of a liability not to have aerial intelligence uh, than it is an opportunity. And so the market has really shifted as a macro level over the last two or two to five years uh, into this mindset of if you're not using drones, if you're not using all of the available tools that you can to get that contextual view, it's actually become more of a liability than anything else. So ROI is already really speaking for itself. Okay, and then you mentioned you've got, I think you said two plus 10 partners, 12 partners, I don't know, are they all in production contracts or are they pilots? So, to speak? Uh, so Supply and license contracts, yeah. So systems are getting shipped every single day and, mm -hmm. and really used every single day. We hit some really neat milestones of uh, how many units were getting deployed uh, in you know thousands of missions per month recently and, and we've been quite excited about that. Okay, but you're not going to give us the numbers because this is a public forum. That's right, right yeah. <laughs> hey, Chris, this is Jay. Um, just kind of, kind, of, kind of following on Bill's question a little bit. I mean, um, a little bit of concern I would have is the public sector sale. It's, it's a very long sales cycle. Um, as Bill mentioned, you know, they have to give something up to buy you, mm -hmm. liability or whatever concern, you know. Body camera has been around for years and years. Uh, there was a you know, certain impetus that made that happen, right? And I'm wondering what's going to be that impetus that makes this a, you know, like you said, a, a liability, um, you know, maybe, maybe that is, but, um, um, you know, um, I guess what's, what's the impetus that make a public sale really buy you? And then how do you take care of the long sales cycle? Do you go through uh, traditionals that work with these public sector companies? And so you're kind of um, selling to them or are you going direct or are you going to the manufacturers of these, you know, Oshkosh, for example, you mentioned, uh, what's right. your uh, go-to-market approach? Yeah, we're, we're really able to uh, kind of harness the tailwinds and, and headwinds of those megatrends like body cameras already, right? So people understand that that evidence locker and video uh, is really valuable to them already. Uh, in the use of those types of systems, they've identified that there are shortcomings, like only being able to show part of the story. And so the ability to go kind of one step further to this fully contextual view is very, very easy for them to understand. We do go through Axon, who is a body camera manufacturer and, and one of the main ones there. We do go through uh, Oshkosh and Pierce manufacturer manufacturing as vehicle manufacturers, uh, the t systems tend to be very, very easy sells to customers because when they're spe specking out a $500,000 or $800,000 fire truck and they have one box to tick on, do I want aerial in intelligence built into this fire truck that I'm offering, it becomes a very easy way to, to uh, end up distributing these across the market. Um, same on the police market with these large contracts that get put together to deploy body cameras across an entire department, uh, do you want some of your squad cars or uh, commander cars to be uh, uh, outfitted with this capability? The answer is is almost and very easily yes. Maybe this is a similar question, but you know, what is the typical sales cycle? And uh, would, you be, would it be possible to share your thoughts on your target, you know, revenue in five years, and how many, you know, number number of customers you, you know, you should get in order to achieve that, you know, target revenue. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I can answer some of that. Our typical sales cycles really vary anywhere between three months and one year, depending on the department and and their purchasing and, and grant situation. Um, we have seen some shorter sales cycles, but those are really the outliers. So somewhere between three three and 12 months is, is the typical there. Uh, in terms of you know revenue ramp, what we're on track for is kind of a 3x uh, year on year from, from there. I won't give public information on what our revenue is right now, but it is quite attractive. And our Series B investors who are closing here in the next couple of weeks are quite uh, excited about it as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Christopher, for your presentation. Thanks. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, so Lizzie offers a B2B SaaS solution to help retail brands integrate the circular economy by renting their products. With that, uh, please start. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Tanguy. I'm the co-founder and the CEO of Lizzie. Super excited to be here today at the Extreme Tech Challenge Category Finals and super happy to tell you a bit more about 
how uh, with Lizzie we're trying to transform the retail industry from linear to circular. So you might know it, but the retail industry slowly became one of the most polluting industry in the world, mainly because we keep overproducing, we keep overconsuming, and the big problem there is that we underuse what we buy. We don't have a planet B, consumers are shifting. In fact, the pandemic is accelerating the shift. Consumer wants to consume less to consume better uh, and more local and brands they don't have choice they need to adapt this is truly our vision is to build a more sustainable retail industry how by building circular economy within retail organization when uh, by deploying circular business model like rental and resale credit cards then split payments were major uh, product access revolution in the past we are coming with product as a service with a new revolution. Since we created the company two years ago, uh, we were at Fashion for Good in Amsterdam. Uh, we met more than 300 brands and retailers. Today, more than 90% of them are interested with the circular economy, but they have no clue how to address it. First, because they have no experience with circular business model. This is something quite new, uh, so we can't blame them. Today, they are selling product, not services. Renting is just about the service you provide to your consumer. And if you look at their e-commerce and logistic ecosystem, they are not made to rent, they are made to sell. And this is truly different the way you manage your e-commerce and your logistic when you rent. So this is why we created Lizzie with my co-founder, Anna. Uh, we built this company to really help brands to become the enabler, to help them integrate the sharing economy very fast. Uh, we help them to launch, to pilot, and to scale because we come with this uh, with this uh, obsession to make it sustainable and super profitable. And you can mix the two. And in fact, we, are, we truly believe that there are no other way uh, to, to, to transform this industry. There are many stakeholders in those big organizations. You need to prove uh, that you can mix the two, profitability, durability. There are other benefits. It's also a very good way to clear inventory. Today, we, as I said, overproduce. So there are tons of uh, products that are never sold that today we keep destroy. In good, uh, good news, there are some countries like France that makes it forbidden now to destroy goods that you haven't sold. So you either discount it, you lose, or you can actually leverage on new business model with us uh, by renting them and make it, making them accessible uh, as a function. Also, of course, for the brand, it's a very good way to target new type of clients. If you have store and you do subscription every month or every quarter, you can invite your consumers to come to your store to pick their merchandise. And obviously, there are upsell opportunities for the brands as well. But also, you will collect tons of data about your products, about your consumer behaviors, and about the profitability at every individual product level. Again, uh, profitability, tracking the profitability is key, but also tracking the true impact of renting versus selling. We have we, we monitor in dashboards the impact that you save on CO2 and on water. Today, uh, we are a two years old company. We just actually uh, uh, closed the pre-series A uh, a week ago. Uh, we have 15 clients, uh, major clients, major retailers, um, that we support uh, in their uh, go-to-market, the circular go-to-market. Uh, in the sporting good industry, we work with Decathlon, Adidas, Puma. Uh, in the fashion industry, we work with Maj, uh, SK, SKFK from Spain, Kiabi, Delce, uh, you name it. We operate today in 25 countries. Uh, and today we are a team of 25 chain makers. Super happy to be there today and uh, hope I can answer all your questions. Uh, thank you. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Tanguy. <laughs> I tried to, to fit uh, the, the pitch in four minutes, huh? so it was uh, quite uh, intense. No, 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 very good. The, 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 it, it, what, what would be very helpful is a little bit more color on, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, my brain is spinning in terms of what could I, what could I recycle versus what not. So some of it is just, taking excess inventory and finding a way to sell it. That seems like that's part of your idea. The other part of the idea is to take my used Adidas and sell, send them back? We, no. 
It's okay. actually <laughs> it's actually like a, a white label. So we provide a software as a service called the reuse management system to brands like Adidas to help them rent some of their goods to rent really like to uh, okay. instead of buying it, you go uh, you can rent it for like you can rent a jacket to go hiking, mountain hiking for a price per day, uh, and then. At the end, you have the ability to keep the product and purchase it, or you can just return it so someone else uh, after can reuse it. And uh, the idea behind also is to, at the end of the, the rental cycle, after, I don't know, like 10, 20 usage, some, like it will be sold in a brattery uh, in second hand. So it will be a one-way uh, uh, shipping to the consumer for a, for a last uh, usage. Okay, so the, the, the circular economy virtue of this is what you're, what, what you're saying is basically instead of just, just throwing out my excess inventory, I can, I can monetize my excess in inventory. Is that exactly? Right? And also as a consumer, for as if you take the consumer perspective, it's also I can enjoy more uh, by paying less, uh, stop owning stuff that I use once or maybe sometimes twice. Uh, keep, you know, like if you know, like 90% of 87% of the of the garments that are created actually ends up in landfills. Uh, you can take that plenty, away. There, there are already plenty of companies that enable me to re re recycle my clothing, right? I mean, in other words, you know, I mean, I can I can use fashion products or whatever. I mean, there's lots of companies already that do this. Re, you know this this circular yeah. thing for for clothing. Your customer is really the retailer, not the consumer. It's B two B, absolutely. We're a B two B platform, absolutely. And white okay. label, meaning that we don't we don't exist in the mind of the end user. We just yeah. provide the technology on top of Salesforce, Magento, Shopify to enable those platforms which have never been meant to 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 rent. We enable those platforms to start renting and to start uh, reselling. Okay, and then you, I mean, you flashed a bunch of numbers, but I couldn't quite track them. Um, so for what's, you know, for your customer, well, first of all, are, are, you, are you still in pilot mode with all these guys or are you in full deployment? You're in full deployment? We are in full deployment. Uh, today, we just operate throughout Europe. So we don't operate the logistic ourselves. We just provide technology to the brand themselves so they can do it themselves or rely on third-party logistic partners. So today we have partners in Europe, across Europe. So we have brands that are renting over uh, okay. across and Europe. What are, and what are the economics of that? I mean, are they getting a, you know, tripling of their profit margin? Or is this a, you know, sort of... Yes, nice it, it's you, you just exactly say it. So we basically, oh, okay. uh, we get between 20 to 60% of gross margin over 24 months with the brand, for the brands. And our revenue model, it's a SaaS, so we provide... Uh, a SaaS, and they pay obviously like a monthly a monthly fee, and we take a commission on each single rental transaction. Okay, okay. I'm sorry, other judges, you can. <laughs> no, thank you, Bill. Yeah. And thanks for the for the um, for the session you made. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> it was great. Thank you. Yeah, let me ask my question. Uh, how to convince your client brands that your circular economy, you know, sort of doesn't cannibalize, you know, their you know own business, but rather will maximize their revenue? So, I mean, today uh, there are not enough data to see. I mean, which is sure is that we don't cannibalize today uh, the, the 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 revenue of our clients for sure. If you look at Render Runway, who's doing rental B two C. 50% of their clients are new, who rent, for example, a dress from, uh, um, I don't know, like uh, Versace, uh, just taking one uh, out, the, out of the blue. 50% of the people who rent, like the girl who rent a dress from Versace, actually are new consumer of Versace. So today it's really more targeting new, a new audience, uh, but down the road, I mean, for us, our goal is to, to really have the manufacturing of goods within 25 years. So of of course, at some point, I mean, we hope that consumers will probably buy a little less, brands will consume, will produce a little less as well, will produce better products and will optimize the usage. Uh, and if you look at the secondhand platforms, I mean, they're growing big, big time. Uh, it's actually now uh, getting a, a bigger market than the, 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 the fast, fast fashion, uh, 50 billion uh, US dollar market. Uh, they see those pure players coming, they are kind of afraid and they have to be uh, afraid. We provide them like with a tool to put their hand into this industry and to 
you know, make new profit out of it and to uh, get more loyal clients because also there is like a higher customer lifetime value when you rent rather than when you buy because you can subscribe to your uh, brand and every every month you will debit the credit card. So bottom line, you engage your consumer for a much longer period, but also this is in the wish list of the consumers to consume better. In, in, in France, there is this KPMG a study that got released uh, several weeks ago that said that 87% of the consumers rather uh, buy uh, from a brand that has a CSR strategy rather than one that doesn't care about the environment. So consumers are going this way. Brands, they have no other choice than following. And if you look at Adidas, Decathlon, or a, a VF Corp, I mean, they are showing the way. And that's why we decided to go enterprise because we want those big guys to show the way uh, so we can in the future go uh, more on the tier two, tier three uh, type of uh, retailers. Okay, then uh, do, you prov- uh, do you provide any like, you know, optimization, you know, a- engine, you know, for those, you know, pricing or, or you know, balancing or, you know, inventory and you know, quantity control? Absolutely. So we do, uh, we create single ID for every single good which are rent because you need to track at the product level, at the unique product level, uh, the life cycle of the good. Obviously, a product that has been rent once or 10 times, the, the, the return flow will be totally different, will not take as long uh, for a product that is still new uh, or for a product that has been rent 10 times. So we uh, anticipate a maximum of movement uh, when it comes to return so we can predict the stock level and put a product back in stock, even though it is still under the end of the cleaners uh, at the DC level. So we do uh, optimize with our algorithm the the, 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 the the revenue, the sorry, the stock level. And when it comes to pricing, today we don't move the price uh, for the rental uh, because this is not a request of our clients. Uh, it's this is the price you get an absolutely almost new uh, product. It's when you go, you rent a pair of ski uh, uh, in, 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 I don't know where, like in, in, in the ski resort, the price will always be the same. Even though the product uh, has been rent 20 times, it's still the same price. This is what the consumer are waiting. But when it comes to second end, we do track uh, the quality of the product. We do track the number of rotation and we are building those algorithms to provide the best pricing for the end user if he wants to uh, make a, a purchase option to to learn to to take out a purchase option and keep the products instead of sending it back and obviously this resale price will be different from one product to another so it's kind of the lottery for for him it might be a product that has been rent only one time so it's still perfectly new and you will get a 20 percent discount or the product has already churned 10 times he wants to keep it and he will buy it at i don't know 40 percent of the retail price got it thank you Thank you. Hi, um, this is Jay. May I ask you a question about uh, your green, um, um, uh, I guess, um, perspective on this? Because um, um, so it sounds to me this, I'm just trying to use a um, kind of a corollary. And um, for us, it's mobility as a service for just selling a car, right? Um, and in some ways, that um, was counterintuitive to what we all thought, right? We thought, Oh, mobility as a service will reduce um, vehicles miles driven, um, you know, uh, traffic in cities, et cetera. But it actually made it worse, right? Um, so, you know, do you see that this could actually create more problems than it actually solves in the sense that you could, uh, these brands will start consuming more um, resources because now you can just rent. So you have to have more, you know, variety or, you know, uh, niches filled, so you actually consume more and build more, uh, you know, uh, produce more, um, rather than the other that you, we all would expect is, oh, you know, you, you, instead of buying your renting, so you you would consume less resources. Can you maybe talk about that that portion a little bit? Sure. So, I mean, it is, if you look at the numbers, it is greener to rent rather than to buy because the biggest impact of a good, uh, it is during this manufac- is manufacturing. If you look at tents, for example, we rent tents with Decathlon uh, here in Europe. You rent, the tent has been rent almost 20 times each. Uh, we have like hundreds of them uh, in uh, in the distribution center. It's potentially like, I don't know, it would be interesting actually to make the count, but uh, if someone rents like a tent, is one tent has been rent 20 times, it, it is potentially 19 product that has not been uh, created. Again, the, at this stage, uh, I will say the numbers of 
rental are too low, uh, even though we're talking about thousands of rentals. Uh, but still, it showed the direction. Obviously, uh, Decathlon at some point will produce less of this tent, but also they are getting tons of really cool data about the quality of the goods because each time they are used, they come back. So we track the, the quality of the, 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 the product when it is returned. Uh, and we can say to the brand, we can help them during their uh, designing phase to tell them this is actually a component. We build patterns, actually. Uh, so we can tell them that after uh, 10 usage, there is always like this component that make it, makes the product almost dead. Uh, if you manufacture it this way, you can actually extend the lifespan of the good of uh, 10, use, 10 more usage. And that's actually a case we did with Decathlon on a new tent that they released last year. Last year. We realized that there were like a component that was uh, a bit uh, flecky. After a few usage, it was hard to, 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 re to rent it again. They actually changed the, 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 the component and the new collection uh, is with a new piece. Uh, it's, um, I'm not going to go in detail, but basically they have a new piece and now the tent can be rent easily like, uh, like 10, maybe 20 more time. Uh, so it is a different way of consuming. People will never stop consuming, that's for sure. They need a tent when they go hiking. They want to enjoy a nice dress when they go uh, in a, at a wedding of a friend. But it's just accessing the product in another way, uh, a way which is definitely more sustainable. And you don't clutter your closet at the end. And one same product will be used between 10 and 20 times. If I have to give one number across all the goods that we rent, uh, like we rent like from luggage to dresses to tents to uh, uh, pregnancy clothes, I would say that 12 is the average number of time that is one single product is used, but obviously it, it, it just varies from one good to another. All right. Uh, good. Thank you so much, Tangi from Lizzie for your presentation. Yes, ready to go as well. Thank you. All right. Thumbs up. And let's welcome Manu, uh, who has designed an electric vehicle that combines the safety and comfort of a four-wheeler four with the flexibility of a four uh, of a two-wheeler. Manu, please. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi, y'all. Thank you very much. Thank you, XTC. And uh, thank you for, uh, for your time, for listening to me. So uh, my name is Iwan. We are uh, Manu. Um, do you know that the leading cause of death for children and young adults is not from diseases? It is actually caused by road traffic injuries. This is according to World Health Organization. I'm sure you are, you are very familiar with these pictures, family and children on a motorcycle without any protection. We have a simple solution. An, an enclosed two-wheeler electric vehicle, it will come with airbag, seat belt, and climate control. Because of our simple yet functional design, we can make our vehicle very affordable. Our patent pending design hangs the driver's seats from the roof. And also the patent pending door design allows the driver to operate Manuf just like a normal motorcycle. For example, when you're at a stop, you simply put your foot out. And when you're ready to go, simply put your foot in and the whole cabin is fully enclosed. Manuf is extremely compact, measuring at only 80 centimeters it means that it can be parked in a motorcycle parking spot. Less space means also less carbon footprint. Beside personal vehicle, Manuf is perfect for ride hailing companies. Right here in Asia, we use motorcycles as taxi. And obviously normal motorcycle doesn't offer the safety and comfort uh, of a car. Um, also in Asia, ride hailing driver is dominated by men, unfortunately, because of gender bias. On taxi motorcycle, there is no personal space. So often there are unwanted issues between driver and passenger if they are from the opposite sex. Manuf can provide woman driver a separated physical space, thus facilitating women to participate in this important industry. Manuf is, is, is designed for the mass market. Because of our innovative design, our vehicle is affordable for the everyday person. Of course, we are not the first one to came out with the super compact vehicle. However, most super compact vehicle on two wheels are very expensive and they are priced more than a small car usually. Now let me show you the market size. So 78% of two wheeler market are concentrated in these three countries, Indonesia, India, and China. The serviceable, the serviceable obtainable market size that you see here is not even including the four wheeler market. 
We are confident that there are interests in this new kind of vehicle like Manuf. So we plan to launch a pre-order equity crowdfunding and we are looking uh, for battery swapping partner that uses cheaper, safer and cleaner sodium ion batteries. As, and as for the B2B side, uh, among others, we're looking you know, forward to partner with ride hailing companies like Gojek, uh, Grab, uh, like, you know, vehicle sharing companies and logistic companies. Our, our plan is to be able to launch our product in 2020, by the end of tw uh, 2023. So he, our team member, it's, uh, it's me, I'm the, I'm the co-founder, inventor and serial entrepreneur. Next to me is Ms. Asusena Pernia from Spain. Uh, who, uh, who has 15 years experience in with United Nation, and Mr. Shankar Nayar from India, who has 20 years experience work for Fortune 50. So our ask is $1.6 million. Take into consideration that our ask is one of a kind of a physical product that will have an important impact on how we use terrestrial vehicle. Thank you. Thank you, Iwan. Over to you, judges. So anyone else want to launch or should I keep jumping? Oh, yeah, let me, yeah, let me start, you know, mine. Yeah, so thank you very much for your fantastic presentation. And uh, what would be the motivation for your target customers to buy this vehicle, you know, instead of like, you know, remodeling, you know, traditional gasoline rickshaw, you know, into a covered vehicle, you know, I suppose like, you know, the majority of the Southeast Asian you know, consumers are more cost performance driven, you know, than sustainability driven at this moment. So yeah, please, you know, let me know your thoughts. It is true. I mean, um, our vehicle is going to, uh, um, we're going to retail our vehicle around uh, 50 million rupiah, which is around 3,500 US dollar. So it is higher than, uh, than like, I mean, the, the, normal, the, the cheapest motorcycle new one that you can get here is around 1,300 to 1,400 dollar. It is more expensive, but uh, I'm not, I mean, I, that's not whether we're targeting like the lowest, lowest segment, uh, segment market, but there is a growing middle income in in Indonesia also, and the I mean like in Indonesia the road infrastructure is that much. It is not going to grow any bigger, and uh, there is around I think the last latest calculation from Toyota was this 40, 52 kilometers, 52 square kilometers of cars new every day coming to the road. So in the end there will not be enough road for all the cars. So what I'm coming in here is with a new vehicle. Probably this is a second vehicle for somebody who has a, a bigger vehicle just to go back and uh, from from work, and and that's why one of our uh, uh, strategy is to probably uh, you know partner with Gojek or uh, Grab with uh, you know ride hailing company who will be the first uh, 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 companies who, who who uses this kind of vehicle, and and you know to get used to this it is it is a very different kind of vehicle. Um, you know, but it, I'm at, I run three thousand five hundred dollars. We think that there are, uh, you know, even like the lower part of the middle income that will be able to avoid, uh, uh, you know, buy this vehicle. Thank you. And I have one more question. Uh, as for your team, uh, do you have a safety design expert in your team? You know that that you know uh, take care of those you know the safety designers. You know, uh, like and also the durability. You know of your vehicle. You know because. Always, you know, the, when you, you know, put your new product into the market, you know, people will start to, you know, compare with the existing products and say, like, you know, hey, this is a, you know, very lower cost product, but how about safety or, you know, crash resistance, durability, etc. So, yeah, how do you have those, you know, experts in your team and how do you convince uh, those, you know, customer questions? Yeah. Um I have to. I have to be honest. I mean, like they, uh, we are, we are, we are, we we have just started our company, so we're in a seat round. We uh, what you are seeing right here, it's a concept vehicle. It's not yet a prototype. So the the seat that we are asking is to make a prototype vehicle and to crash test it. I mean, the closest one we have here is Malaysia. We do have we do have to do crash test, and we you know uh, uh, with the funding we do need to get the licenses and and all the safety features also. And I don't know one the 1.6 million dollar. I know it's very expensive. One of the reason is because like chassis designer are very expensive. That we don't have them. That's uh, part where we are missing. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I, I have a follow up question in regards to your your comments about uh, targeting Gojek and 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 Grab specifically because I understand that they are working on a crowdsourced driver model. Uh, so the actually the 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 
the demand uh, for your bikes would come from the individual bike holders, not actually from Gojek or Grab. So how do you intend to uh, kind of extract that collaboration with Gojek and uh, Grab? Uh, I know that Grab is uh, Grab is working with a bank. For example, the Honda PCX electric vehicle. I mean, those yeah. one cost about like uh, you know almost more than double than my vehicle, and it's a very expensive yeah. vehicle. But they've got a few hundreds of them already on the road. And yeah, we need to work with a financial uh, um, middleman. Yeah. Okay, so th those are strategic investors in Grab already. So. How how do you specifically uh, plan to target collaboration with Grab and Gojek? Uh, we've spoken to a few of them that they uh, you know EV head they are interested in this. I have to tell you I am not one hundred percent sure how we can get um, um, uh, financing. Well, how, are, how are you pitching to Grab and Gojek? I've I've pitched them already, and uh, if for example one of the when we pitched to them, one of the, um, you know, one of the, uh, let's say, negative and positive at the same time also, it's when they see it's like, oh, okay, this is like, wow, your, cool is pro your product is really cool, but how am I going to put your product in our app? Because we have the four-wheeler and your, then the two-wheeler, but we don't, we see that your product lies in between the, their four-wheeler and the two-wheeler application, um, uh, you know, on, on, on the grab, so like car or the Gojek. Okay. I, I personally don't see a problem there because if you use Gojek for, for Grab, you see a premium category for cars. So it, it won't be an issue. So, But I, I, I was just more interested in how you're solving the, the, the microeconomics uh, of your pricing versus um, some of the other um, two-wheel drivers' uh, incentives. I, I, I like, if, I mean, like if you say there is a premium one, then probably it'll be like a Gojek premium, then, you know, the, the, the driver can charge more than, 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 than a normal Gojek ride then, isn't it? Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm sorry, Bill, go ahead. No, I just, uh, you so, uh, you and I wanted to thank you for clarifying your 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 at least your product explanation at the beginning. But you're asserting that your core value proposition is saving children's lives, but that's not really your core value proposition, right? I mean, that was right. I mean, that's not why people would want to buy this, correct? For safety and comfort, yeah. Okay. All right. Just I just wanted to, you know, close that loop, but. Good work, thank you. <laughs> okay, all set. Great, thank you, judges, and thank you, Iwan from Manu, uh, for your presentation. Great, uh, let's give the judges a minute uh, to tally up your scoring, and let's invite Squishy Robotics to this virtual stage. Alice, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Victoria. My name is Alice Egagino, and I'm CEO of Squishy Robotics. We provide life-saving, cost-saving information in real time through our rapidly deployable mobile sensor robots. We have an innovative solution that provides time-critical data when and where it's needed. Here's an example use case. This chlorine tanker derailed happened in the middle of the night. The first responders didn't know what they were walking into and didn't realize the tanker was transporting deadly chlorine gas. As a result of this poor situation awareness, there were nine fatalities and over 600 injuries. This is how Squishy Robotics comes to the rescue. Our sensor robots can be rapidly deployed by aerial vehicles. We have tested them to drops of up to 300 meters. They can survive the landing and can continue to submit critical data to first responders even before they arrive so they can know and prepare for what they would be walking into. This video shows our work on a training exercise with one of our partners, the LA County Fire Department, our, the third largest fire department in the US. Our robot is dropped by a drone into a simulated hazardous emergency caused by an overturned truck. Emergency responders are able to view the chemical data and the video feed from a safe distance. There is no need for complicated parachutes or tethers. Early wildland fires is another use case that could save lives and billions of dollars worth of damage. 
Consider the Butte County wildfire in California with 86 deaths, $16 billion in damage, and huge negative impact on climate change. This fire could likely have been contained earlier if the utility had used squishy robots to detect and look at faults for the wildfire. Um, so what do first responders use today? Current hazmat response often requires first responders to suit up in the bulky seats you see in this picture to the right and hand carry sensors to properly assess and plan the response. While they're doing this, they're exposing themselves and the local community to danger. Squishy Robotics has a better solution. Our sensor robots are impact resistant, can be deployed in fleets, they provide 360 degree vision and can carry customized payload. Our distributed computing architecture blends edge computing and data fusion to support data informed decisions in real time with the ability to create mesh networks. Cloud computing and machine learning will improve our data analytics over time. With this architecture, we can fuse our data with local sensor data in industrial and smart city applications and optimally place new sensors needed with our AI algorithms. We are working in three markets, starting in public safety and defense monitoring and delivery, and moving into commercial and smart city applications. Squishy Robotics provides, as you see in the left, customized sensing solutions in the middle of platform for third-party delivery, like this uh, military robot that we're doing for the Army, and a monitoring and data as a service. Revenue models include hardware and software and data analytics sales. Here are some metrics of our customer traction, including $1.2 million in non-dilutive contracts and grants. We are working with the largest and most influential fire departments in the United States. For some reason my slides are stuck. Okay, there we go. We are working with the largest and most influential fire departments in the country. And our earned media has led us to improve customer development. Looking to the future, this is our product platform roadmap. We are testing our stationary robot with customers now and our mobile robot in the lab and in the field. In fact, this week we've been testing fire detection and prevention with CAL FIRE. We're performing R&D to create aerial ground hybrid systems and optimal placement of sensors. Squishy Robotics is a female owned business. I am CEO and a professor of mechanical engineering at UC Berkeley. I'm joined today by Denise Jogur, our chief operating officer. Our leadership team has deep experience in robotics, artificial intelligence, data analytics, and product design. So thank you for this opportunity to present the work of Squishy Robotics, and we look forward to your questions. So thanks a lot, Alice. I'm just curious, you, you, you start with this, the drone delivered, they're drone delivered sensors. Um, but toward the end, it looked like your go-to-market is actually stationary set sensors. Is that is that what I heard? Yeah, uh, we we have this product platform, and so the stationary sensors is the first product we would sell. The mobile robot is being tested and field tested in 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 the lab. Okay, and and in either case, you're still sort of in pilot proof of concept in terms of where you are. In. Yeah, we, we have non-dilutive funding to help de-risk the product. We okay. need to get safety certification, and we're working on that right now before we can actually make a sale. But we have pilot agreements with the largest and most influential fire departments in the country with the intent of a sale first in the first responder market. But we're also working with industry on a number of different projects for testing as well. Okay, and in terms of your sensors, I need, I have... It, I, it sounded as though each each robot needs to be pre-configured with the right sensor for the right application. Is that true? You don't have like a, you know, sort of universal combo sensors on these robots, or what? It would make it kind of big and bulky, and yeah. so we, we do try to, <laughs> to tailor it for the particular customer. But for instance, what we're testing in the field this week with Cal Fire is a fire detection and monitoring robot. And so pretty much the robot's the same thing, but we can take out and put on different customized sensors. Okay, so in a stationary sensor, what sort of radio are you using? How are you connecting? Well, we can use, we, we have, and we've tested with a range of communication techniques, but for the first responder market, we're using long distance radios. 
And the reason is often, often first responders have to work in areas where there's a lot of concrete and many cell phones and other communication devices just can't go through the concrete or work in those areas. And we found the long range radios to be the best bet for what we're working on in that market. So then you need to implement some sort of battery is that, you know, for the stationary guys, right? Yeah, well, it does have internal batteries and that's a design decision for how large a battery we use. Yeah. Okay, I get it. Yeah. Thanks. Hey, Alex, this is Jay. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, just a quick question. So um, it, it totally makes sense, you know, stationary robot mobile deployable via drones for things like, you know, wildfires or some critical emergencies. But you also mentioned that one of your target markets is going to be going with smart cities or, or um, you know, in the uh, industry, uh, you know, so potentially like a Ford could be a customer in the future. But how do you see yourself uh, differentiating from, you know, kind of traditional stationary monitors we have in our factories or whatever um, to something that would be mobile deployable, but like yours. Um, I'm just trying to understand where the fit would be with a commercial customer like a, you know, just a, you know, uh, like a Ford or, you know, uh, any other uh, that is not kind of like not emergency driven, I guess, right? Well, that's a great question. And we've really been thinking our business model. We like the Google idea that your product should be used at least twice a day, like the toothbrush. And uh, we're not just emergency sensing and decision making. We provide that service, but we also see ourselves as long-term monitoring and operations. So for example, in the industrial market, we see, our, we see permanently installed sensors as our friends and not our enemy. Because we're working with uh, OSI and Blue Force, some very large cloud computing companies. Uh, OSI, now Aviva, but just recently bought up with Aviva has the largest market, industrial market for petrochemical companies and electric utilities in, in the country. And so what they do is they provide cloud service with all of these permanently installed sensors. We've gone through the data analytics of taking in that data and seeing where there are, are potential problems while we're monitoring. And then we rapidly deploy a sensor where we need to include more information using uh, expected value of information to determine where the optimal placement would be. So we see ourselves as aerial ground sensor solutions because there's some things that can only be measured from the ground. There's some things that can be best measured from the air and there are sensors that we want to build on the uh, growing number of sensors that are permanently installed. Oh, what is your expertise, you know, that makes your business defendable from your competitors? Well, we have a wealth of experience to start out with. We've got a great team. Uh, I started the first integrated AI hardware laboratory on the UC Berkeley campus where I hold a faculty position. We have one patent that has been granted. We have two other patents that are pending. As you can see in our roadmap, we've got new technologies on the horizon as well. Uh, speaking in the high level, you know, is it the sensor hardware technology or you know, the analytics, you know, software or AI technology that differentiates you from your competitors? Well, we see ourselves as an information company, but we gain that information through the hardware and unique ability to place it in, in rough areas, rough terrain, and emergency situations. Hey, thank you, Alice from Squishy Robotics. A minute to the judges, and let's uh, get our next presenter settled, Wheel the World. And I just want to say, I do have a robot oh. here. Oh. They do exist, but it's <laughs> in my home. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to, you know, throw it from a high place. <laughs> That's what we do when we do a live performance. We throw it yards away or as far as we can. So, so, thank you for a great presentation. Thank you. Just while we, before we lose Alice, that there's a kid's toy that has that, design, right? I mean, did you, <laughs> what, I mean, was that an inspiration for that architecture, the, the quote unquote squishy architecture? Well, the squishy architecture is based on tensegrity, which was coined by Buck Mr. Fuller. Okay. You that. only have tensile and compressive elements, but yes, okay. um, I, the, the original research was funded by NASA and that toy, it's called a tensegra toy, is a tensegrity, six bar tensegrity. And it, it was used in our joint project with NASA for space exploration, we put delicate sensors in the middle of the robot to orbit a planet, land on the planet, and walk away and do scientific monitoring. But that was their inspiration in starting the project. Mm 
And the reason it's good, it works co-robotics with humans. It's a, it's a form of soft robotics because anytime that there is an impact, it gets distributed and won't hurt a small child in the case of the child's toy. Yeah, right, right. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next presenter, a uh, pleasure to welcome Wheel the World, which is a marketplace to list, discover, and book trips for people with disabilities. Well, very excited to, to be pitching my company here. My name is Salvaro. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Wheel the World. Um, I am 36 years old, and, and when I was, since I'm 18 years old, I have a disability, and I permanently uh, use a wheelchair for all my daily uh, daily activities. Um, and my dream since I was a kid was to visit this place in Patagonia, Torres del Paine. But for many years, I saw this as an impossible thing, given that the lack of accessibility that I assume of this travel destination as many others around the world. But one day with my very good friend Camilo, today my co-founder, we decided on figure out on how to do this trip. Uh, and we needed to figure out the accessible accommodations to stay, how we would move around. We, we, need, we needed a specific equipment to navigate the Patagonia trails. And we become the first group ever with a wheelchair user to do Torres del Paine trip uh, with a wheelchair user, myself. And the trip was amazing for me, for my friends, for the people who work for the travel industry there. And then our story went viral and thousands of people started reaching out willing to repeat that same trip that I did. People with disabilities or families and friends that wanted to repeat this trip. And we started organizing this trip to other people. And we realized the opportunity that there's 3 billion people in the world that has accessibility needs. That means 1 billion people that has a disability and 2 billion that are directly related to them as families or friends. And they are only in the US spending $60 billion in traveling every year. Um, that means people with disabilities plus their companions. It's a huge market and the opportunity and the problem is that the current solutions for them are not designed for them and they are having terrible experiences, specifically because information about accessibility has not been digitalized yet and it's very hard to find and inaccurate. It's a, an overlooked uh, um, uh, segment and already people are traveling and many people can start traveling more if, they, if we design it and become it more inclusive. That's why we founded Wheel the World uh, with the purpose to make the world accessible. And the solution that we are building uh, is basically the booking.com or the Expedia for people with disabilities and seniors and their companions. We are collecting and raising the information of accessibility in detail of accommodations, tours, and activities. And our platform has a specific user design for accessibility needs. So our travelers can find what suits their needs in terms of accessibility with a customer experience that knows about disabilities and, and, and allow them to book a confident trip. And we are collecting this data and this information through an app, our community of people that more than 100 people have, has been collecting data points in, in terms of hotels and tours and activities. So an offer the platform with specific information of, of accessibility. For example, in a, in a hotel, what's the height of the bed? What's the width of a door? How the bathroom looks like? So someone has, can, can and do an, an informed booking in terms of accessibility. We started in 2018 and basically in few listings in destinations in Latin America where I grew up, we allow uh, around 1,000 US Americans travel to, this, um, to these destinations and achieve $1 million in revenues. That happens between 2019 and 2019. And we realized that there's a, mark, a network effect in our business as, as long as we increase the number of listings and destinations that we can offer around the world, the number of travelers that we can convert is more and we can make more, more revenues. And we have built an amazing brand that has been featured by Mark Zuckerberg. And um, so we have built a powerful brand. For example, Mark Zuckerberg has featured us and also we have won the best accessible travel company by uh, mentioned by Lonely Planet. Position people with disabilities as people that can achieve anything and we can do amazing things as anyone else. And our team is actually built by people with disabilities or people that are directly related to them 
We're 20 people represented by six nationalities and 60% are women and based in Berkeley, California. Go Bears, I know that some of you are. And, and also Santiago de Chile. Um, last year we raised in the most dramatic crisis of the travel industry, we have raised our seed round of $1.8 million, uh, specifically to develop our team, our systems, and increase our listings and destinations. And we are in the mission on the growth stage of our company to position Will the World as the best solution for people with disabilities to explore the world. And we want to achieve these metrics uh, by the end of 2022. $1 million in annual bookings, uh, 1,300 listings, and 5,000 new people signing up in our platform. We believe that with these metrics, uh, that we are all already tractioning and having good results this year, finally, after a very tough 2020, we believe that we will be in a good position to raise our Series A uh, with institutional uh, VCs. This is what we move us, uh, make people with disabilities travel the world, and we, wanna, we want to allow millions of them travel to thousands of destinations through Go Will the World. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe maybe I'll start off uh, this one. Um, thank you for the presentation and quite inspired by by your trip and your story. Um, my first question is actually around your your kind of fundamental vi business vision. Uh, you did mention that you kind of want to be the booking.com of of the of the um, uh, accessibility, um, but. One question that I had was then are you more focused on the hospitality and flights um, and the bundles there or are you more focused on the experience sector? We are today focused in um, in two main products, okay? One's our multi-day trips. That means we make sure that we have like accommodations, ground transportation and activities, so fully itineraries to reduce the uncertainty of people with disabilities. And that's how we grew the first two years. After that, we started realizing that people wanted just to find accessible accommodations, not only in Patagonia as our initial story, but also in New York and in San Francisco and in uh, Miami, Florida. So we started collecting in detail information about hotels, um, which is kind of our opening on how to uh, convert new clients and more clients and then eventually uh, do up sellings with, with, um, with multi-day trips, connecting with other services when they already uh, book um, a hotel. Um, we, we don't, we, we don't um, focus on airlines yet, uh, but eventually uh, while we scale, um, we believe that also some, is something that we, can, that we can consider too. Okay, in terms of your, you did mention that your you're working with third-party service providers. I understand disabilities come in different forms uh, and different severities. So how do you ensure the quality of service um, level in terms of your, your, your service offerings? Yes, yeah, so we have a team. We have, our team has like three different teams, right? One is in charge of the demand side and how to make their brand and our platform and, and our marketing. Second team is the engineering team, develop our systems. And the third team is the supply side team, right? Like the partners team. And we are reaching those partners. We are collecting the data through an app and, and, and training their stuff or our mappers that we call, that is our community that is going to, to measure and take the, all the accessibility features. We provide them a report on how the accessibility looks like and also we allow them when once they partner with us a, an online um, a, an online course about accessible travel uh, to make sure that we uh, that they increase their uh, knowledge and and and, um, and trainings about accessibility uh, we are having this into very into into a lot of details that we are raising more than 200 data points per listing so we can uh, provide this data through our web, uh, website so people can understand um, how their accessibility needs can be met because that, that's also one of the challenges around disabilities. Every disability has different needs. So we are like committed to raise this information in detail so people can understand what are the details so they can um, um, 
uh, decide uh, on their own site. Okay, thank you. So, um, Alvaro, could you could you help us understand how you make this a big, you know, big business? I mean, it's love the mission, love the vision, but there is, you know, pretty, I don't know, I mean, pretty much every hotel does have accessibility information. Um, I'm not sure where Airbnb is on that, but, and then there are, you know, there are other ways to find accessibility tours. I mean, it's nice that you're pulling all this information together, but how do you, you know, how do you turn this into a, a, a you know, a big broad-based, you know, unique company? Um, well, well, actually it's, it's, it's the problem that we're, um, what, what we are achieving. So actually yeah. Airbnb and booking.com doesn't work for people with disabilities. And people who use our services, including myself many times, are mm -hmm. having terrible experiences because they haven't focused on get this informa accessibility information and they haven't focused on understand what is the accessibility information that you need. And Airbnb, Booking.com, they raise around three to four like data points around accessibility. And the majority of the times, people who use their services, they realize when they get to one of their listings, it's not accessible as they were mentioning in the details because uh, because it's an underserved market and, 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 and that's happening. That's happened to me. You can find on Twitter people like saying how uh, how they have bad experiences through the current the current services. And actually, Booking.com is one of our um, our backers that at the beginning they invested on us with this value proposition, acknowledging that they, they have to be doing so much. Uh, in order to achieve this, this is a we are talking about a ninety billion dollars market cap company. Um, so we believe um, this is a is a relevant problem. It's not a, an unproven. If you uh, and if you think about accessibility information, yeah. actually it's not. Today you can find everything online, right? You can find right. where where's in a restaurant, uh, how what, what are their prices, how you can get there, but accessibility information hasn't been digitalized. Yeah. You cannot yeah. know if a restaurant in, in in San Francisco, California, has the what's the width of a door to, to entrance the, 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 the bathroom, uh, what's the space between uh, tables to get inside, and if they provide a braille, for example, um, menu uh, to get a restaurant. That can be replicated to so many industries. The travel industry is the one we want to focus and start with, but... Right. Uh, this is an, a very overlooked segment, and then I invite also other companies here that I have um, seen very exciting about how they are developing their systems to also consider accessibility mm -hmm. uh, in terms of mo mobility and transportation. So this is right. a huge problem that hasn't been solved yet. Okay, okay. And then in terms, so it, are you mainly crowdsourcing this data? Is that what I heard? I mean, we are. It's it's a sem we can we can call it like a like a semi crowdsourcing data. So okay. we are we have a, a web app with different journeys to map out accessibility of a hotel or a or a tour or an activity or a museum. Okay. And we are inviting people from our community that we already have like around like two hundred people on different places of the world yeah. uh, that they sign up. We provide them an online training to make sure that what they raise is actually accurate and they don't uh, make mistakes on how to uh, raise this information and okay. they map this information for us. That's today uh, the main uh, way that we are like collecting this data. Mm -hmm. Eventually, when we grow the number of listings and we can become more relevant, we see our partners that they will start doing this on their own, right? Because they want to be, they, they, they are going to be part of our marketplace. Um, actually, they are already started to do it, uh, but we are bringing a third person, like a third party person trained by us to map these facilities to make sure that we are collecting the right data. Okay, and then last point, you it looked like you did 300,000 in June alone. Is that, and is that yes. GMV? Is that GMV or is that your take? GMV, GMV, our take. Our take today is around 25%. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. And your million, this million dollar number is the take. Is that what you're saying? No, it's the GMB. So That's the annual GMB. Yeah. Okay. Because it, it it seems like you were you were underselling your accomplishments because the way I read it is you're already at a like $3.5 million run rate. Isn't that fair? Am I uh, right? Can, can you repeat the question, please? So based on your June numbers, you're, you're at right now a $3.5 million run rate in terms of your bookings. Is that uh, right? Yes. I yes, mean, actually. I know, I know you're seasonal, but you know, you're pitching that you're telling us you got a $1 million target, but you're at a $3 million run rate. I think you're underselling your performance. Is what I'm saying. Actually, <laughs> we, 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 uh, I mean, um, we are um, we are underselling because uh, we cannot assume that this great month will continue on every month of the year, specifically because we are in high season, right? Um, uh, we believe that tracking that committed that we want to grow um, 30% every month. That's our growth, and we consider this our 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 previous results during April, May, uh, we right. totally underestimated our, our estimations uh, on June. Um, uh -huh. But we believe that if we continue this track of 30% growth month over month, we had, we will achieve the $1 million in bookings. Uh, we have yeah. a runway of 20 months uh, with uh, with $1.2 million in our, in our bank account today. Okay. Um, so um, yes, maybe we are underestimating our business. Uh, we can I, talk in two more months and see how how this growth yeah. looks like. <laughs> okay, because you're you're but you know you're multi you know you're bi hemispheric, right? I mean, so is most of your bookings in Latin America now, or is it where are most? I mean, so you have the opportunity of of reducing seasonality because you're covering both hemispheres. Exactly. So. Um, the first two years of operations, 2018 and 2019, right. we achieved U.S. Americans traveling to Latin America pretty much. Okay, uh -huh. That was 90% uh -huh. okay. of our clients. Uh -huh. During 2020, yeah. to be super honest, uh, we couldn't achieve many bookings because yeah, of yeah, the content. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, what we, and what we push is to um, build um, a relevant uh, supply site on the U.S., Mexico um, and Hawaii, pretty much. That ha that has allowed us this year that ninety percent of our bookings has been from U.S. Americans traveling in the U.S., Mexico, and and Hawaii, pretty much. Uh, but you are right. Like um, today, fifty percent of our inventory is actually closed because down here in I I I am now in 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 at home in Chile, uh, borders are closed. Um, so eventually, when it starts opening, we, we estimate that by September of this year, uh, our, our, our traction metrics should increase um, drastically and also start um, uh, making grow the European market that we haven't focused yet. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Good work. <laughs> Uh, in terms of you know the scaling you know of your pro, uh, your you know tour package offering, uh, what is your additional effort required in order to like you know certify you know the accessibility and make sure that you know the whole you know, uh, and consolidate those you know large number of data points that you collected? Yes. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned before, uh, we. Um, we are collecting this data and we are offering this uh, through GoWillTheWorld.com and, and we are focusing on the destinations that we that we really want to be relevant in, okay? Um, and uh, and eventually while we scale, we will uh, we will allow like our partners to to onboard uh, out um, by their own uh, to our platform. And, and also what we want to achieve is not necessarily uh, offer this data of accessibility through our through our platform GoWillTheWorld.com. We are building our systems uh, very um, as a multi-service uh, architect with a multi-service ar architecture. So eventually, we can connect this accessibility data not only to GoWillTheWorld.com but also to Airbnb, to Booking.com, to Expedia, 
uh, to cook.com that is the largest Asian right um, experience platform. Uh, so also they can have access to the data that nobody else have, and they can have access to this data. So that's also how we want to scale on our, on our demand side. And uh, in terms of your geographic you know, scaling, you know, when you expand, you know, your you know business or, or tour region, uh, do you like you know uh, expand like in a like broad area at once, or do you focus on specific territory or even specific country one by one to to kind of you know assure your quality? What is your those expansion strategy? Yeah, we focus on travel destinations, and we have like tier one, tier two, tier three. Okay, the tier one are the ones that we are deciding on how to expand our inventory. And we make this decision be, 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 because of three relevant things. First one is, okay, market data. How many uh, people travel to these destinations uh, uh, annually? Second one is uh, the, the data that we are collecting through our platform from our users that are, are telling us where do they want to travel. Okay, so we, 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 we can focus on those ones. And the third consideration is, okay, how feasible is to uh, uh, raise relevant accessibility information uh, uh, on a, on a, on a, on a cost-effective way to, to build a relevant um, uh, um, inventory of, of listings there. Um, so, for example, today we're focusing a lot on the main des travel destinations in the U.S., uh, also, Mexico, that is one of the countries that has been more visited by U.S. Americans. Uh, and eventually, we want to start also expanding in Europe, that is the second uh, uh, largest international destination that U.S. US Americans uh, normally travel to. Very clear. Thank you. Great. Thank you, judges. Thank you, Alvaro from Wheel the World. Thank you very much. Great, admitted to the judges, and while we bring back our uh, last presentation today, uh, Phoenix Mobility. Antoine, do you want to get set up? Wonderful. Thank you very much for having me today, and, uh, and thank you very much for taking the time at the end of this presentation to, to discuss together. Um, so today we're going to talk about, um, first, a big challenge that we all face, uh, and that is pretty clear, uh, which is the ecological and sanitary challenge. And that comes from the uh, global gas, global house gas emissions. So actually, there are today uh, more than one billion vehicles on Earth, and these vehicles are responsible for 20 to 30 percent of the GHG emissions around the world, which also causes actually 3.5 million deaths every year uh, around the whole planet. So this is the first thing. But actually. This thing leads governments to implement a lot of different traffic bans and a lot of different regulations to make sure that we take off uh, those pollutants from our road. So actually, fossil fuel will be banned across Europe uh, uh, by 2050, uh, and uh, all fossil fuel vehicles will be banned from big cities in Europe, uh, so in Paris, Madrid, Amsterdam, and I'm sure it will also be the case uh, in the United States uh, and, uh, and soon in, uh, in Africa. Um, the problem is that electric vehicles only account for 2% of the world vehicles. The EV offer is very low, is very limited, is super expensive, and does not uh, answer to the specific needs of the different uh, people using vehicles, especially professionals, uh, so uh, people having a business and operating inside the city. So, that said, we are facing one big challenge. Um, how can we reach our decarbonization goals without compro compromising daily operations for business? And what will become the one billion vehicles on Earth? What are we going to do with them? And do we have enough resources to, um, to put them to the trash um, and, um, and just build one new billion vehicles? Obviously, our answer is that we don't have these resources uh, and that we have to use these vehicles to produce new EVs, uh, but actually converted vehicles. And this is what we do. We have developed since uh, 2018 a conversion kit uh, to transform any fossil fuel vehicles into electric. Um, and this technique is known across Europe as retrofitting. So how it works is very simple. 
our customer comes to our workshop uh, in the morning, ju just before going to work, he drop off his, vehicle, his uh, fossil fuel vehicles. Then we have a, li a little bit of work uh, on our side. And he comes back at the end of the day. His vehicle is fully electric. Uh, it's uh, no longer polluting. It's no longer noisy. And it's, uh, it's perfect and uh, fitted to go inside, uh, inside the city and, uh, and everywhere else. Our solution makes us three times cheaper than any EV on uh, the similar market. So we actually break all the barriers to make sure we can enter this market because the price is still the, the main limit uh, to the worldwide uh, adoption of electric vehicles. Our EV emits twice less CO2 as new EV uh, because when you manufacture a new electric vehicle, obviously you have to uh, use uh, resources uh, and these resources pollute. So actually, uh, we do not uh, pollute anymore with these resources. And then you have a, a broad access to, um, to a wide range of uh, new services, including uh, software inside our kits, uh, inside our the tablet uh, in the vehicle, uh, fleet monitoring system, etc., etc. Our solution uh, is very tech-oriented, so we have designs, uh, we have several patents around our uh, technology and our kit is very standardized. So what is very interesting to, to uh, feel uh, in this slide is not that we are super techy and that uh, we, we know how to do beautiful 3D, uh, 3D designs, but what we have to, to take from that is that we have developed a universal module that can actually transform any vehicle on the market in electric in uh, just one day. So the thing is, today you have all the manufacturers across the world uh, pr promising to have uh, uh, fully electric, um, uh, fully electric vehicles inside their um, their forecast uh, by the end of like uh, 2030. But actually, we can do it right now in less than uh, in less than a day. The other thing is that we have developed also. Um, a new uh, propulsion uh, system uh, with this kit that can be licensed to manufacturers after that. Uh, and so this is the evolution of our business model. Today, we are uh, focusing mainly on uh, government and SMBs with utility vehicle or special vehicles. Um, but later, we'll focus on uh, licensing our solution. For our clients, uh, we answer to strong regulatory constraints and we uh, lead to a big cost reduction. And for us, we have no competition on this segment, and we have large and homogeneous uh, orders. Just to give you a little bit of background on, on our impact, um, on our impact, our vehicle emits 60% uh, less GHG emissions compared to keeping a, a diesel car, 36% less emission uh, compared to uh, buying a new EV, and an average cost of minus 11% compared to uh, the uh, the brand new EV on a running uh, on a running side. So. You, you actually invest in our solution, you don't buy it, uh, you just have access to less cost at a lower price. Today, we are at the end of our engineering stage uh, and we are starting industrialization. So this year, we should deliver around 100 to 200 vehicles and uh, we are ramping up our production to uh, to achieve a target of 100,000 vehicles converted by the end of 2025, um, which is uh, online with the uh, uh, with the goal of um, of the different cities uh, across Europe. Um, finally, I just want to say that the the um, the automotive industry has been an industry monopolized by just a few actors uh, within the last century, with no real innovation uh, than the motor and the way we produce car, uh, which has been invented more than uh, 100 years ago. And with our solution, we have the opportunity to lead the way towards the adoption of clean vehicles around the world by converting them into uh, EVs for a cheaper price for the customer and for the planet. So let's make mobility cleaner and more accessible altogether. Thank you very much. So Jay, you got to run this one, okay? <laughs> this is you. Yeah, no, thanks, Bowie. Yeah. Um... I was going to let the other folks talk first, just so I don't influence it too much. But um, no. I mean, I guess um, how many? Good question for me to understand is that it sounds like you're very early in the stage, so you've never not done any of these retrofits. Um, and your business model is you're going to set up a garage in five cities uh, where people have to bring their cars and in one day convert their vehicles. So uh, it sounds like there's a 
to me, um, you know, uh, a scalability issue in the sense that, um, you know, um, it's a very manually yeah. intensive, um, you know, uh, business um, location intensive as well. So, you know, in five cities, how many cars can you do? Um, you know, um, so to me, I, it seems like um, it's a business that's very limited in reach. Um, I, I like your, you know, um, um, vision, but um, I just think it's a very difficult operational challenge. And so maybe can you talk to how many vehicles you expect to do maybe in the first year and how, how are you going to scale this business that's, you know, seems very in manually intensive in location yeah. specific. Yeah, definitely. So you're, you're totally right on this part. Um, it's um, it's location specific and it's pretty intensive in work. And the automotive industry is a is a very difficult industry um, to scale in. And I, I think you're you're the expert in that. So so you're totally right for when you say that. How how we can do it? So the first thing is that we already have operations, and so for now we do everything by ourselves. So it means that we have workshops uh, where people design the kits then assemble them, uh, so manufacture the different kits, and then install them into a vehicle. So this is a pretty linear way of, uh, of working. What we are doing right now is that we are expanding our uh, capabilities so that we can differentiate these um, events. So design is just done once for a standard uh, conversion kit. Then we have um, the, um, the manufacturing side, so building the product, the kit, and then we have the installing side. So Actually, uh, designing and manufacturing can be uh, pretty straightforward and like uh, it's pretty simple to industrialize that kind of stuff and, uh, and ramping up uh, production. So what is very difficult is the implementation side, the installation side, so installing the kit inside the vehicle, inside our client vehicles. And so we've designed something that is very plug and play and that um, and then we can scale through a network of garages. So right now we have 200 garages in France uh, with uh, with who we have a, a partnership, and so that we uh, so that we'll scale our operation, uh, and actually they will uh, we will become a platform uh, where you can ask for a clean mobility, and we can say okay you just have to go to this garage we have trained them they can install our uh, product into it uh, we build the client the client goes to the garage, he drops off his vehicle and at night he just. Uh, you just go go back to the garage and, and has this vehicle uh, fully uh, electric. So this is how we plan to to scale uh, to scale this. Uh, so what what is good is that we are actually um, building also an asset of of uh, garages, uh, like a, an asset that is the network of garages, uh, and that we will use then in the future to develop a wider range of service in uh, the electric mobility sector. Uh, and so. Maybe become the the leading uh, the leading uh, network in uh, in EV services uh, in the world or something like that. But it will be for the future too. Okay, okay. thank you. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's more of a comment than a question, and maybe you can you know maybe uh, balance it into a question. But I mean, where we've seen um, success with this kind of model is actually more in scrappage, right? Not retrofit. Um, so governments will incentivize scrappage of older vehicles, you know, gas customers or whatever, uh, uh, smog producers. And and so then the people will take those off the road and it'll be scrapped and then they'll get a new EV vehicle, right? So um, it, yeah. it seems like incentivization is a faster approach to um, getting to a greener world than retrofit. And then second is um, the only place I've seen this kind of uh, retrofit maybe working and, and and I've seen several competitor or um, companies in this space is in the commercial space so like retrofitting school buses or you know uh, uh, trucks because um, uh, and vans because you know they typically build body on frame which means they're easier to retrofit than a unibody car you know that uh, you and I drive so uh, I guess maybe can you talk to why you think you'd be successful in this retail space, um, you know, cus uh, consumer vehicle space, um, where most of your competitors probably focusing on the commercial space, um, you know, uh, and 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 you know, government policies are really focused on scrappage and you know, um, you know, ten thousand uh, dollar EV credits and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, so so you're totally right on the um, on the incentive um, um, space. Um, and so actually, what we've done uh, in France is that we've lobbied the government and the, the different uh, local bodies to have the same kind of subsidies 
than uh, than traditional EVs. And actually, our uh, main argument is that uh, since we pollute less thanks to our conversion technology, we should have like uh, the double uh, subsidies than a traditional EV manufacturer. Well, obviously, the government doesn't agree uh, on that uh, yet, but um, but they agree on uh, giving us the same level of subsidy than the traditional EV manufacturers. So in France, we have the uh, retrofit, uh, retrofit subsidy, which is uh, 5,000 euros per vehicle. And then we have local subsidies that can account uh, for four to 6,000 euros per vehicle converted. So, so it leads us to between nine to eleven thousand euros in terms of subsidies. So, actually, it means that you can have a fully electric vehicle for something between like five to ten k maximum, all included, uh, um, with uh, with our technology. So, we really speed up the the adoption uh, of EV. The second thing um, regarding our uh, positioning is that um, I, I totally agree with you. Um, what is good with the um, what is good with the automotive industry is that you have just a few models that actually account for a large part of the business. So if you can develop something that suits like one to two to maybe up to five models, you can uh, you can then uh, ramp, ramp it up uh, for like 90% uh, of the market in a segment. So so we have low technical development to, to address a large part of the fleet. And so today we have two strategies. We have the first one that is focused on uh, utility vehicles that is largely um, uh, left aside by uh, traditional manufacturers, and then so and this is for business. Uh, so we target fleet managers. So it's really big deals, uh, very uh, a very scalable approach where someone can just ask you for 100 or 1,000 conversion in just one deal. Uh, so it's uh, it's pretty efficient. And then we have kind of a mushroom strategy. Uh, so so we we call it that way. And we actually target all the um, all the special vehicles uh, that that we could convert. So it means, like for example, uh, in Paris, we work with um, a towing company, and tow trucks do not exist in uh, in electric version, but uh, they have to enter uh, a low emission zone. They have big uh, re um, regulatory constraints, and they do not have a solution. So either they stop their business operation, or they pay us uh, a pretty fair price uh, with big margins, uh, and uh, and we convert their vehicles. So we are really in the space where where actually the thing that you were saying on uh, incentivizing is is really key to us because you have places where people can't go with electric vehicles. Electric vehicles do not exist for every client. They are very expensive. And, uh, and actually, manufacturers won't produce enough electric vehicles by the end of 2030 to uh, to address uh, uh, the market. So, so like we are perfectly uh, spot on to to accelerate this uh, this transition uh, toward electric vehicles and, and clean mobility. Okay, great, great. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. So, uh, you know, I, again, these the vehicle retrofit kits have been around for as long as electric vehicles have been around. I mean, so this, you know, this retrofit idea is not at all new. And I got to tell so I, you know, I just, I got, I got to say that what, what your business, your business is brilliant. It seems obvious. I don't understand why it hasn't happened yet. I don't, you know, so, I mean, this is a silly question, but, you know, all the other retrofit technology companies that have been out there forever why hasn't it scaled? Why hasn't this worked? Yeah, so like, you know, this is very funny what you say because I was not the one who had the idea in the team, I must say that. And, um, and so when my co-founder came to me and said, uh, Antoine, you know what? We are going to convert a, a traditional vehicle toward EV. I, I told him, obviously we're going to do it. Like, like why has uh, no one done it so far? It seems really obvious. And so uh, we didn't have the answer at this time. And so we just started our operation. And actually, um, we realized that the, uh, the automotive industry is very hard. Uh, so um, you have, to, like, you have to, to break a lot of barriers to enter this market uh, on the mechanical side, electrical side, software side, regulation side, everything. So, so it's really heavy in terms of work. Uh, so th this is a, a one thing. The second thing is that I think the, the tech maturity was not high enough uh, to, to enter this market um, uh, before one or two years ago. Like, batteries were very expensive. Um, 
And, and you add to that that you are a small actor, so you don't have access yet to large economies of scale. Uh, so, so it's really hard to position in this point. And then uh, you add to that that like, you have to pick the, um, the good segment and develop the, the perfect technology or you will be crushed by the competition. Like, uh, uh, a lot of people focus on like, vintage vehicles or stuff like that. It's brilliant and, and I love what they do. But this is not scalable because you, you can just stay to uh, a beautiful garage that, that has wonderful operation, but that does not scale and does not have a, a tremendous impact. And so if you want to do that, you have to develop um, a really like standard conversion kit that is really plug and play and that, that you can uh, put inside the vehicles. And so that, that's how we, we believe we can, uh, we can crack this market and, uh, and, uh, and become the, the, the leading uh, manufacturer in this. I have a question about you know, your market size uh, in a longer trend. Uh, when there will be more and more new EVs in the market, uh, will your total available market become larger after 10 years or become smaller? And also, how do you keep your price advantage once the you know, EV becomes more commoditized and cheaper? Yeah, so, so on, our, um, on our price, so actually we have um, a cost reduction roadmap um, that goes with uh, like achieving um, tech um, uh, tech uh, stuff uh, inside our company, so developing better softwares, developing uh, specific parts that will help us um, uh, choose other components that are cheaper. Um, so, so on the tech side, uh, we are lowering our cost. Then we have a scale advantage. Uh, so for now, we are uh, twice less expensive than traditional manufacturers, and, and we are like 1,000 one thousand times smaller than them, so it means that we do, don't have any uh, any uh, scale uh, scale economies um, compared to to traditional manufacturers. So I, I think we will uh, we will manage to um, to um, have a, a big uh, a big cost advantage still in the future. Then you're right. Uh, actually, uh, if uh, everyone has electric vehicles, then I don't have any market. It's it's true, but actually, it, it will take very, very longer than, than what we think, uh, because today we are at uh, 1.3 billion fossil fuel vehicles on Earth. According to all predictions, it will grow to 2 billion vehicles by 2050, and manufacturers won't be ready to, to uh, ramp up electric vehicles uh, to replace it by uh, 2050 either. So actually, uh, we still have time to, to build operation. If every vehicle is, is electric and that we have sufficiently contributed to that, I will be fairly happy and, uh, and I'd say that uh, our mission is done. But the, the thing is that we can bring our company even uh, at the next step because once every electric, uh, once every fossil fuel vehicles become electric, then every electric vehicle can become autonomous, shared, uh, and enter maybe a new space of mobility. Uh, we will also have our um, and, uh, garages network uh, that we can uh, that we can uh, like uh, build new business lines uh, upon that, and then we will also have our um, uh, drivetrain uh, expertise that we will. Uh, sell back to manufacturers or even build our new EVs uh, with, a, with a really uh, experimented uh, drivetrain. So this is how we see the, the market uh, changing and, uh, and evolving uh, for us in the, in the next years. Thank you. So Antoine, one quick, one quick clarification. How many cars have you already retrofitted? Um, so we, we do not display this number, but it's more than 50 and, and less than, than 100 right now. Uh, okay. <laughs> so you're just you're just getting off the ground. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we are like we are entering the industrialization uh, uh, space. So we are uh, processing our first uh, assembly lines and uh, and stuff like that. So so it's the beginning of the site. Okay, and then where are you making where are you making your kits? Uh, so in the in the southeast of France, and uh, you are more than welcome if you want to to visit us uh, at at some day. But uh, but so it's uh, it's in Grenoble, uh, so it's a, a small city. Uh, well, relatively a small city um, in the in the southeast of France. Uh, we have our, our uh, own workshops there. Okay. Yes, I'd love to visit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you for uh, your presentation. I, I want to give big thanks to the judges, uh, Jun Hobei, Shinya Kasuga, 
Jay Kim and Bill Reichert for your thoughtful questions, particularly for Junho and Shinya. I know it's really, really late in Asia right now. Um, and also huge congratulations to all the uh, startups presented today. We're just really in, in, impressed and also inspired by the great work you're doing uh, to build a better world. And all the startups are now part of the XCC family, and we will continue to help you expand your network. Uh, as everybody heard, they're looking for uh, investment as well as strategic partners. So to learn about, more about these companies and all startups from XCC 2021 finalist cohort, please head to go.philo.com slash XCC and visit their virtual booth. And you can also vote for your favorite startup. And uh, the winner of that People's Choice of World uh, will, will go to pitch on the final event presented by TechCrunch on July 22nd. And our uh, category final series continues tomorrow until next Wednesday. So stick around and come back and check out Enabling Tech on Monday and Clean Tech on Tuesday and Wednesday. And then head to our website uh, to find the links to join. And then we'll be publishing the uh, public announcing the category winners on uh, July 1st. Uh, but head to our, our YouTube channel uh, for the recordings if you miss any sessions. And then everybody here and, and everywhere is invited to join our final event presented by TechCrunch on July 22nd. It is 100% virtual and free and open to the public. So uh, come and watch the top contenders pitch as well as stay for the virtual networking with thousands of corporate executives, VC, tech founders, policymakers, and domain experts. And we'll also have some roundtable discussion as well. Uh, so this wraps up the public pitch session of Extreme Tech Challenge Mobility and Smart Cities Category Finals. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we'll see you again Monday for the enabling tech uh, track and follow us on social media to get the latest news and updates from XCC and have a really great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and oh, yeah. judges, yeah, Thank judges, you. check your email uh, and that's where you find the deliberation link and I'll see you in that room.